Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. To ask a question during the question and answer session, please press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect. And I'd like to turn the meeting over to your host today, Mr. Leland Milstein. So you may begin. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for being with us today for ACT's webcast. This is the third, or sorry, the Thursday webcast series, which is a bi-monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two model organizations' methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. This session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE Category 1. If you haven't already given me your certification number, please email me after the session and we will hook you up with that. Also, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which ACT can provide to members who request one. So again, just email me after the session if you need one of those. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees. Please consider joining if you are not already a member. And I want to say a big thank you today to our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. And uh, a big thank you to our presenters, Jim Woodworth and Greg Page, and especially to Greg, uh, who's been uh, very gracious and has done four sessions with us today in this series, Species Selection. This is our final webcast in that series. Today's session is Species Selection Part 4, Life After Planting. Once you've put a tree in the ground, the heavy lifting of ensuring its long-term health is only just beginning. Proper planting, mulching, and watering are essential and sometimes are overlooked. From diseases to pests to human-caused harm, there are many dangers that may cause the demise of a tree. Trees in cities must endure poor soil, little growth space, pollution, and other threats from the urban setting. It is necessary to give urban trees special care, not only for their survival and well-being, but also to protect people and property from the hazards trees can become when abandoned to a hostile environment. After all, we all prefer trees that shade homes, landscape trees, and flower in the spring over fallen limbs, barren landscapes, and empty tree pits. To start us off today, we have Jim Woodworth from Casey Trees. Jim is Director of Tree Planting at Casey Trees in Washington, D.C. A graduate of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and an ISA certified arborist, Jim previously worked with the Natural Resources Defense Council on restoring the Anacostia River through environmental advocacy, promoting the watershed approach, low-impact development, and stormwater management, including the report entitled Out of the Gutter, Reducing Polluted Runoff in the District of Columbia. Thanks for being with us today, Jim. Leland, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I'll, I'll jump right in here. Uh, I know we have uh, just a little bit of time, and uh, I'll make the best use of it, hopefully. Um, and I apologize for the first slide. Um, perhaps the PowerPoint's do's and don'ts. Uh, don't use lots of bulleted text. I assure you this is the only uh, slide I have with lots of bulleted text. Um, and um, But I just wanted to start off with some, some broad basics. Um, and starting from the day of planting, uh, for us in D.C., protecting the trunk um, is perhaps one of the most important and cheapest and simplest things to do. Um, many varieties, I have two images there, sort of do's and don'ts. Um, and uh, the simple trunk guard for, for a dollar, uh, whether it's bought off the shelf or home fashioned from its other materials, um, that's extremely important to do from, from day one. Um, uh, because one thing we see is a, a lot of mower damage um, especially in our public spaces. Um, watering and mulching, uh, weeding, uh, basic stuff that, that uh, is very easy to have volunteers help with. Um, we facilitate uh, throughout the season uh, service projects to do that kind of work. Um, and then uh, pruning, I think uh, I'll talk a little bit more, a little later about um, in terms of how much or how little to do and when to do it. Um, and then we're, we're seeing um, that uh, Staking and guying is perhaps something that uh, is optional uh, or unnecessary in a lot of cases. Um, most importantly, uh, keeping an eye on your tree. Uh, we rely on a GIS inventory for all the trees we plant, whether it's public or private space, uh, to track those trees. Uh, so 
an absolute do is to put that tr tree into a, an inventory and keep an eye on it. Um, uh, the familiar photo at the bottom left here, I'm sure we have many examples across the landscape where we're, we're doing too much of a good thing. Uh, over mulching, uh, volcano mulching, however you call it, uh, we want to uh, discourage that practice uh, as best we can. Um, and um, uh, over watering, uh, not a problem for us this summer. We've, uh, we've done our best to water as much as we can. Um, uh, certainly with, with uh, extreme weather, we may have some, some wet seasons, but uh, uh, this is not one of those uh, this past summer for us in D.C. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip to my next slide. And um, uh, flip fast forward uh, five or ten years. Um, when our trees have reached 15 to 20, 25 years, they're, they're just beginning to return all their benefits to us. If we've gotten them to live this long, uh, we cannot forget about them. Uh, we need to make regular inspections uh, for all the urban hazards that uh, can do trees in after establishment, um, whether it's wrapping holiday wires um, or forgetting to open up the uh, sidewalk grates or protecting the tree from uh, construction. Um, we, we need to keep an eye on these trees on a regular basis. Uh, so, so um, you know, many of our urban areas are engaging in uh, some ambitious tree planting programs, very much focused on getting trees in the ground. Um, but um, once these trees begin to pay dividends, we need to keep an eye on them so that they can continue to provide benefits to us so, so that, um, that all that planting work is, is all, not for, all for naught. Um, now, um, with respect to um, pruning, I'll say just a few things. Um, most importantly, uh, how, when, what kind of pruning and who does that pruning. Um, uh, a reminder about the importance of the three-cut method, using sharp, quality hand tools. Um, questions about what kind of pruning. Certainly, broken, dead, and diseased branches should be removed um, whenever needed. Uh, but I think there's some interesting questions about when to engage in structural pruning. And I think uh, the professional opinions all over the board from at the time of planting to uh, just after establishment or anywhere in the sort of two to seven year range. Um, we have just kind of begun a structural pruning program using our own field staff and trained foresters to engage in some um, fairly severe structural pruning of American elms. Um, uh, but other uh, street tree habitats really back off on the pruning um, for street trees especially so that they have as much photosynthetic capacity um, as possible to ensure, you know, development of a strong root system and, and solid trunk taper and whatnot. Um, so I'm kind of curious to hear what my colleague Craig thinks about uh, pruning in the, in the early years. Um, I want to turn to spend most of the time talking about our watering efforts. Um, because I think that is probably the single most important factor for us to get uh, trees established in the first two to three years. Um, pictured here are all the familiar um, watering tools, uh, the five-gallon bucket, the hose, the gator bag. Uh, perhaps less familiar to folks are the, the ooze tube in the, the top right here um, and uh, the uh, $3 AutoZone funnel there to facilitate uh, filling that up. Uh, all the sort of common tools we provide uh, ooze tubes to anybody who plants a tree with us at Casey Trees. Um, and then uh, we encourage uh, schools and community groups to get their own uh, buckets and hoses. But at, 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 at the uh, base level, those are the most important tools to get yourself going on watering. Um, and then uh, thinking more broadly about social media, um, the web is also an important tool for us. Uh, and we have sort of LinkedIn uh, the web, the blog, the Twitter, the Facebook with um, a campaign. Um, so uh, it's helpful to have uh, a, a slogan. 25 to stay alive is the number we chose, uh, in part because our ooze tubes are 25 gallons, so there's a convenience factor there. Uh, but we've also developed a, a weekly uh, color code, uh, dry, normal, wet, based on uh, annual rainfall to date and uh, rainfall and soil moisture over the past week. Uh, so we can clearly communicate to folks who've gotten trees through Casey Trees and to the broader public, um, yes, it's time to water. Um, a little bit of uh, reminder, uh, shame, uh, propaganda can go a long way towards uh, 
reminding folks to, to get those hoses out before they head off on summer vacation um, to make sure those trees get watered. We've also worked into this, you know, the, the used tube with the Casey Trees logo and a free rain gauge to really connect people to their weather and how much rain they're getting when it does rain and, and the, uh, the effect that has on their tree. Uh, I think we often get quick little storms and people think, oh, the tree has plenty of water, it's fine. Uh, we're finding that often it's not enough water and uh, our supplemental watering efforts are really, really critical to uh, our first two years of establishment for our, for our trees. Um, I want to uh, just give you a peek at um, our operations. I want to shift gears and talk about how we water both with, with staff and with volunteers. Uh, safety first here, the traffic cone, the vest, the flashing lights, um, very important when we're watering public uh, space trees uh, throughout our city. Um, we engage volunteers, um, church groups, uh, alumni groups, college groups, um, in the very simple acts of weeding and cultivating, uh, installing a news tube here, um, and watering. And that is a nice uh, uh, morning activity to, to bond with a group um, and to get out to public space trees, in particular uh, parks, schools, cemeteries. Um, we don't work with volunteers in high traffic areas like medians and whatnot, uh, but volunteer groups can go a long way towards supporting uh, other folks' efforts uh, in watering. Um, and then, uh, and in terms of our own operations, here are some of the other tools we use: uh, a five gal a 500 gallon bladder, uh, gravity fed, uh, pulled on a trailer here, uh, a 250 gallon motorized tank, um, and then uh, the the uh, classic five gallon Home Depot bucket. Um, we move a lot of water this way. Um, however, water um, is heavy. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but for our own operations, this is some of the tools we've been using. Perhaps the most important and versatile tool for us has been the, the fire hydrant meter, uh, which we get permission and permit to use from the local water and sewer authority. Uh, this device here hooks up and allows us to safely and legally tap the public water supply anywhere we go throughout the city uh, with different valves to whether you're hooking up a large diameter fire hose to fill a bladder or a reducing it down to a garden hose. Uh, this makes it very easy for us to water any tree uh, within a radius of several hundred feet of hose anywhere we go in the city. Um, and, and so from that, um, in our own operations, we have three of these meters, uh, one for each of our crews. Um, and this is a snapshot of our summer crew. Uh, I wouldn't want to underestimate the uh, the utility of uh, about a dozen uh, high energy high school kids to do a lot of our watering for us. Uh, at eight or nine bucks an hour, they worked eight weeks and they watered uh, almost 5,000 trees uh, this summer for us using the variety of tools that I mentioned here. <laughs> Here's a, a little Charlie's Angels pose with uh, the squirt gun is not the most effective watering device, but um, uh, having a fun time during the heat of summer is essential for um, Esprit de Corps. Um, the most innovative thing we've done recently is, is uh, move our crews to the bicycle. And uh, while water is heavy at a pint a pound, um, towing around a water bladder in a tank is, is uh, extremely fuel intensive. Um, by using that hydrant meter and a couple of coils of hose uh, stuffed in the back of this bike trailer, um, we have gotten four, four guys out on the streets um, in a very public fashion, um, raising awareness about water and getting out to a variety of public sites throughout the city, uh, promoting watering and doing it. Um, it's our second year of, of this program uh, and uh, we've seen productivity increase uh, dramatically and um, we're trying to do something in a more sustainable uh, fashion. Um, so we're extremely proud of that uh, little project. Um, and uh, that's, that's that's my spiel. Thanks, Jim. So uh, I think what we're going to do now is open up the lines for questions time. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star then one. Please record your name. That is needed so you know when your line is open. So again, please press star then one if you might have a question on the phone lines. One moment. And uh, I also want to remind everyone that you can also ask 
question online. If you don't want to talk over the phone, you can click that Q&A tab on the top of your uh, window and type in your question to me, and I will ask it of the prevent presenters for you. While people are coming up with their questions, I wanted to start out uh, with, with – I have several, but <laughs> we'll let other people ask after I get one in there. Uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you about uh, – this summer being so hot and actually there being great media coverage of the need to water and care for trees, uh, how – that's that's definitely drawn attention and I, I'd imagine gotten people engaged. How do you think uh, groups and cities and tree advocates can leverage that and keep reminding people even as we move into fall of the need to care for trees? Yeah, I think it is important to kind of get out in front of it. Um, the past two summers, we were kind of just gearing up our summer program, and um, uh, trees were already exhibiting signs of drought stress. Um, so, and we ran out of ooze tubes. We had such a run on ooze tubes with folks coming in to get them to adopt their own city trees. Um, we, uh, that's not a bad problem to have. We were moving lots of watering bags, um, but um, yeah, I think um, we've kind of developed. Um, an approach that is now more easily replicated for us in future seasons. We've we've linked up the operations with our sort of GIS mapping, so we code trees by uh, by species and location and age, and prioritize the trees that are most in need. Um, we use the public media campaign to also orchestrate our own operations. So if it's a if it's a code dry day or dry week, uh, we know our crews are watering and they're not weeding and mulching. Um, and um, I think being out there with our logo and doing it um, by example uh, has, has also raised a lot of awareness and, and appreciation and concern. Um, but it's, it, we've, for the first time, trying to try to tie it all together with some PSAs, with the online piece and with the distribution of, of tools to help people uh, water their own trees. I think you guys have done a great job of getting the word out, and I think it's something that uh, people are in increasingly engaging in is this sort of uh, social media online aspect to get people involved in caring for their trees and watering trees. Casey Trees on Twitter and lots of other uh, organizations have posted, have tweeted uh, or posted about what the sort of temperature level is and the dryness level is each week and what people need to be doing to, to go and maintain their trees. Uh, Fran, do we have any questions in queue? No, we have none on the phone lines. Okay, well, we've got one over the Internet. How many years, for how many years do you maintain the 25 gallons per tree per week rate? Well, I guess conventional wisdom is that the tree needs about a year of establishment per caliper inch at the time of planting. So a two-inch caliper tree, we're advocating that we use those water bags for two full growing seasons. Um, and in some cases, they don't stand up to uh, two full weed whackings from the public mowing crews. Uh, we found we'd had to replace them uh, in some areas quite frequently. Uh, but, yeah, I think uh, the, the rule of thumb for us is at least two summers. Um, uh, and yet our um, – some of the most recent mortality data for urban street trees is suggesting that um, maybe that one-to-one -one ratio of caliper year, year per caliper inch isn't necessarily true, that maybe trees need more than two or three summers of watering uh, to really get them established. Um, but, yeah, two years has been our sort of rule of thumb. Great. Uh, some more questions over the, the web. Do you have any experience using hydrogel products in your watering program? We do not. I know uh, the city arborists have. I know others have, but we have not. Okay. Um, and another question uh, coming in from someone who has had problems at some sites with overwatering due to poorly drained clayey soils. Do you encourage your staff and volunteers to stick their hand in the soil or use the soil tension meter uh, to check whether or not any water is needed at all? Um, we, yeah, I mean, using the thing just by touch, yeah. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the plastic bag of the used tube actually acts as a bit of an inorganic mulch and it keeps it nice and moist down there. Um, but, uh, you know, we had 
so little rainfall and, and such hot temperatures that there really wasn't much question for us. Um, we haven't had any recent summers where uh, we have overwatered and um, I anticipate that in the future, you know, we're nimble enough that we can adjust our messaging, uh, but I think it's also easy enough for folks to forget about watering and um, so we haven't had to deal with that problem per se uh, yet. Um, it may be a, a challenge for us in the future, but um, we haven't used any special tools, um, uh, but certainly sticking your thumb or finger in there and um, you know, sampling that way is, is more than effective. Great. Do we have questions over the line? No, not on the phone lines yet. Great. So uh, one question that I've got for you, Jen, is when you are – You've got uh, volunteers out there doing maintenance or, or perhaps after planting trees. Uh, when you do some training, I guess, at the end of a, uh, a planting or the end of a, a workshop, there are, I'm sure, a number of factors that you're trying to teach people about, including mulching, including uh, watering, and like you mentioned, pruning. What are the things that stick with people most, and what are the uh, – care aspects that people, for some reason, just can't, that, that don't stick with people and people don't perform? I think uh, we made a lot of headway with the um, volcano mulching and planting our trees at the right depth and exposing the root collar uh, and the trunk taper. Um, I think people are catching on to that. Um, I think uh, the, the need for staking um, has also... Um, been addressed, and uh, I know uh, across the city, uh, several entities have done away with staking entirely, uh, or been much more proactive about removing staking before it becomes a problem. Um, I guess the 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 watering certainly has caught on uh, with many different partners. Um, I think the the biggest problem is more of an entrenched um, issue, if you will. Um, I think we should stop planting uh, certain street trees into tiny tree boxes. And I think we need to begin to open up much larger growing spaces for, for the most urban of trees um, in our downtown areas and sidewalks. And uh, the trend towards uh, converting a 5 by 9 tree box to a continuous planting strip or something more complicated, such with silver cells or structural soil or, or something else to give it more space um, is probably the more difficult, more expensive, real long-term uh, issue that, that we'll need to deal with. Uh, the, our, our best efforts at getting a tree established in the first two to five years are for naught if that tree outgrows its space and, and dies after 15 or 20 years. So I guess the the tree space design issue is still uh, perhaps the most important issue to for us to be investing time and energy and resources and advocacy into. And uh, what – this is a good question in terms of thinking about longer term or different ways that we would need to care for our trees and protect our life after planting. Uh, what sorts of vandalism problems have you encountered and, and how do you guys deal with those? Um, well, yeah, trees get snapped, trees get stolen very infrequently, but um, I think the more uh, common situations is car doors nicking and bikes getting locked up to them and um, dogs and compaction. And um, I think uh, the the vertical tree grates, the 18-inch wrought iron tree grate is, is very effective at providing some protection to the base of the tree, the soil around the tree, and the tree trunk itself. Um, in some cases, the simplest solution is, is just to replace, re, replace and replant. Um, I think uh, in most cases, um, it, it, that's, that's the best way to go. Okay. And uh, Fran, any, any questions in line? No, not in queue. Okay, I've got one question for you about uh, sort of more long long term looking down the road. Uh, when you see uh, older established trees and they've got sort of damaged bark, 
uh, how I guess where where is the line between uh, the the right steps to take between uh, if there's something that can be done and trying to care for it versus uh, you know it's being a lost cause. <laughs> um, well, getting into the whole sort of hazard tree assessment uh, realm, um, uh, I guess these things depend on the nature and extent of the wound and and the decay and the, the species um, in terms of um, how it's going to react to the wound and and um, and then you know where is this tree in the landscape in terms of its potential targets should it fall. Um, is it a street tree that could fall on uh, car, or person, or property, or is it, uh, um, you know, in a less populated portion of a park or someone's backyard? Uh, so the, the the setting really has a lot to do with the the hazard value of that tree. Um, in terms of treating a wound, um, I, you know, the painting and Slapping on materials and so the old school methods are, are not advised usually. Um, though there may be some new research I'm not familiar with about treating wounds, certain kinds of wounds, certain species with certain uh, topical solutions. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I think that depends a lot on the species and its ability to withstand abuse and uh, where it is in the landscape to make the call about uh, um, pruning or sending like that tree or, or removing it uh, at a certain point. Okay, great. I think at this point we are going to move on to our next presenter. Folks still have questions. We're going to do another question and answer period at the end, so we'll, uh, we'll be able to address those then. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you, Leland. So next up is Greg Page who joined the Bartlett ranks as Arboretum Curator at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratory in Charlotte, North Carolina, in May of 2005. Greg's career in public horticulture has spanned 20 years. Uh, prior to Bartlett, he was at the Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Belmont, North Carolina, and the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. Additionally, he has worked at the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, the Holden Arboretum outside of Cleveland, Ohio, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, as well as tours of duty in the landscape maintenance world, the nursery trade, and even a stint as a horticulturist at a cemetery. Thanks for joining us yet again for one, the fourth and, and final time today, Greg. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Um, and just want to thank Jim. He did a great job. And going to echo a couple things that he talked about and, and reconfirm some, some things, but um, a good a good segue and a good job in covering a, a, a big topic in a, in a short span of time. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear off into the wild blue here. I wanted to, to briefly, since this is the, the fourth part of four, to just do a real quick 10-second recap and, and review of all the things that we talked about to kind of tie all the, the ends together and, and bring all the parts and pieces together so that it all is relevant to those of you that didn't attend all uh, all four of them, and I will encourage you to go back to the website um, and, and, and check those out if you have not had the chance to do so. Um, the first part was nursery selection, starting with getting your plants and, and the types of things to look for. Seasonal landscaping was part two, uh, defining what your plant is going to look like in the landscape and how it's going to be used. Part three was the right tree for the right place. And today we're talking about life after planting. And in part one, we talked about nursery selection, where to get plants. And you know, this is this is where it all begins: is getting a good quality plant. And a lot of issues that you deal with down the road with the tree can be uh, you can you can avoid those if you start with a good quality plant. And the basic things to look for when you are looking for plants are quality of, of nursery selection. The selection is diverse. They've got lots of things to choose from. They're buying from knowledgeable people. And of course, price is an issue, and it's always going to be an issue. But it all begins with, with the selecting of the plants.
in, in regards to price, you, you definitely get what you pay for when it comes from buying plants. If you get a cheap plant that has some issues that you don't know about, you're going to pay for that down the road, whether you think about it in, in the short term or the long term. So you get what you pay for in, in most things in life. And I heard a good analogy about healthy trees today. We were talking about the issue with, with eggs and salmonella. And, you know, healthy chickens have good, healthy eggs. And if you start with a healthy tree, you're going to have less stress down the road. And seasonal landscaping was talked about, extending the season of interest in your landscape with the plants that you select, uh, defining the use of the plant in the site. What do you want that plant to do? What do you want to accomplish? And what things are you looking for? Leaf color in winter, spring, summer, fall, fall color, uh, timing of bloom, what the plant's going to look like in the winter, if it's deciduous or coniferous, how that's going to affect your audience, how they're going to interact with that, all important things to think about in, in one of the sessions we talked about that in, in more detail. And selecting the right plant for the right spot, looking long term and down the road, choosing the right plant for that spot in the in its location in the in the landscape. Here's a quick shot of a plant that kind of went awry, had good intentions initially, but you know started to grow against the house, screening too much. They didn't think long term in terms of how they wanted that plant to interact with that landscape. And today, life after planting, a growing concern. How do we get to that point where the plants are healthy and happy in the landscape? And, and Jim brought up a really good point. You know, there's that first couple of years of that plant's establishment where you really have to, to, to keep a close eye on it to ensure that it does get established. And, and I like the rule of, from a tree perspective, every inch in caliper is about a season's worth of growth that tree is going to need to kind of get established, to get happy in its new environment, in its new home where it's going to be growing. I want to talk about tree planting uh, real briefly. Very important aspect of, of having a healthy tree, planting at the correct depth. You know, you need to see that root flare. It should be flush or, or several, you know, a few inches higher than the grade because that tree may settle. You know, if you've got the opportunity, Jim talked about having a, a, a good growing site for that tree, enough room to do what it's going to do. That's very important, and we're starting to realize that the, the, light, the landscape below the ground is, is very, very important, if not the most important factor of a tree. Um, so get that tree enough room to, to establish. And uh, Jim mentioned pruning, and I'll talk about that in, in, a, in a little more detail later on. When I first got into this, this business, they always told us to remove as much codominant and, and structural pruning at that point of planting. And we've learned over the years through lots of research and lots of trial and error that give that tree enough photosynthetic tissue to do what it's going to do, to go through that stress when you're planting, and you've got time to, to work on that tree structure. You know, two to seven years of that young tree's life is, is a good time to do some structural pruning. And uh, staking, I'll talk about that in a little more detail. And, and we've found out through trial and error and through the years and lots of research that you know, unless that, that tree is in an unprotected spot, and if it's, if it's firm in that root ball, firm in the planting hole, you really don't need to, to stake it. Wrapping it, um, if you need to protect it from lawnmower blight, from animals, we do a lot of tree protection with cages here for deer in, at my arboretum, but I'm speaking more of the tree wrap. Again, years ago, they used to tell us to wrap those trees up and, and keep them on for a couple of years, and that's really not beneficial to the plant. And a lot of times people forget to go back and, and take those off. So real basic tree planting guidelines. And I, um, I've mentioned in several lectures, I don't think I've mentioned it in, in any of these webinars, uh, if you're planting a bare root tree, or a bald and burlap tree, excuse me, and have the opportunity to remove that cage, um, as much of it as possible, you're going to head off some, some issues that may develop as that tree grows and, and spills into its new planting site. So if you've got the opportunity when you plant it to remove some of that, that's the best time to do it. A couple of shots of trees that were planted too deep and the issues that develop from that, um, cankers, girdling roots, uh, this is a tree autopsy we did on a crab apple in a parking lot, and that tree never had a, had a chance. It was too deep in the root ball before it was planted, and that tree was probably six to eight inches planted too deep. 
uh, removing the straps off the root ball when planting, that's eventually going to girdle that tree and cause issues down the road. Real basic things, same type of thing here. Here's a piece of wire um, that's attached to that planting basket, and you can see this tree starting to send up some, some adventitious buds, some growth where it's being stressed out. And from a container planting standpoint, very important to loosen up that plant's root ball to tease those roots apart and, and get rid of some of those girdling root issues and really splay it apart so that that grows into that new planting site. So real basic tree planting issues. Another one is timing. Um, certain plants like to be planted in the spring. I like to tell people fall is usually the best time and the best rule of thumb. Plants are starting to go dormant. There's less chance for uh, transpiration, water loss, and just a better time of the year to, to plant. This is a tree planting that I passed on the way to work three weeks ago in the, probably the hottest July on record for North Carolina. Uh, temperatures in excess of triple digits for three days in a row, and they're out there planting these trees. And, and here you go, we're off to that, that, off to the races with that stress down, downpour. All these trees, all the effort, uh, purchasing the plants, storing them, planting them, staking them, watering them, mulching them, probably every single one of these trees is going to die and have to be replanted. So if they had waited a few weeks, they would have avoided all those issues. And talking about mulching real briefly, Jim mentioned uh, the mulch volcanoes. Um, I think we are doing a really good job in educating the public about that, but this is a, a, a surefire way to cause some serious stress and damage to a tree. Two to four inches of mulch is plenty of organic matter to provide water retention, organic matter, and protection of that plant's soil, and uh, give that plant a good, healthy root zone to grow and keep it off the, the root crown to, to avoid any issues. Typical shots, you see it far and wide, coast to coast, uh, the mulch volcanoes. Uh, there's no reason to do this. It's aesthetically un. Uh, it looks terrible. There's no reason to do it. It doesn't help the tree, and it actually stresses it out, causes girdling roots, and uh, not a good thing to do. There are guidelines out there on, on staking, and I like to tell people you only need to stake a tree when it's absolutely necessary. If it's in an exposed location where there's lots of wind, lots of traffic, lots of visitors, people moving around, if you're planting a bare root tree that doesn't have that nice, heavy, established root zone or if it's a small inferior root ball that you're planting and a high use site those are those are situations where you probably need to go ahead and stake some of the negative effects of staking is it inhibits root development the natural sway of that tree by the wind it closes the tr and makes the trunk taper increase and helps develop a good healthy root system and uh, I don't know how many times I've seen trees where contractors or people that have planted them have forgotten to go back and and take those those stake systems off. Here's a shot of one here. Here's a Bradford pear that broke off about four feet from the ground. They took the stake off, but they didn't take the, the nylon cord and the rubber hose off, so that tree grew over that, included the bark, and in a, a light windstorm, it snapped the whole top of this tree off. Another one, a lace bark elm in a, a shopping center parking lot. Again, they removed the stake, but they left uh, the wire and uh, the rubber hoses on, and that's eventually going to kill that tree. It's already fighting for its life below um, where the, the rubber has completely girdled the top of that tree. If you do have to stake, here's a good system that we use. Um, it's a product called the Tremado. Pretty easy to find. They're about 8 bucks a piece. That's fairly expensive, but all the parts and pieces of that can be reused. We plant a lot of bare root trees here, and they work perfectly for that. The rubber band in the upper right picture goes around that trunk, doesn't girdle it, kind of cradles it, but still allows that tree to move back and forth to increase its taper and develop a good root system. But you need to go back and take those off. The picture down below is one that we let go a little bit too long, but um, a good staking process that I've used here with, with a lot of success. And watering. Um, probably the easiest way to kill a plant is too much or not enough, and very, very crucial, and I'm glad that Jim spent a lot of time talking about this. It's the easiest way to, to make a tree go in the, in the wrong direction. And, and what's the magic number? You know, every five to seven days, I love the, the shot from Casey's site with um, 25. I think that's a good rule of thumb and a good message to, to tell to people. You can use tensiometers to see how much moisture is in the soil, and if you don't have that resource, 
just checking the soil by, by hand, sticking your fingers down in it, seeing how dry it is. But the, the 25 rule is, is a good rule of thumb. And, you know, two, two seasons is a minimum just to keep an eye on, on plants, just to make sure that they're, they're being taken care of throughout, a, throughout its, its initial development in the, in the landscape. If you've got an irrigation system, it's not a fail-safe. I've seen more plants killed by them, either overwatering in most cases, but sometimes underwatering. So monitoring those systems is very important. A rain sensor costs about $30 to put on any irrigation box. Nothing drives me crazier than to see irrigation running either during or right after a heavy rainstorm. This, this tool right here is an easy thing to add on to a, an irrigation system. And uh, that's the next precious resource, and it's good that we're educating people about that. If you do have a system, continue to monitor that. It doesn't take care of itself. You don't put it in and walk away. Make sure the filters are, aren't plugged up, that the, you're getting good coverage. The other thing that drives me crazy is to see heads squirting into the, into the road or on, on sidewalks. Um, and there's lots of new heads being developed that don't use as much water. Um, you know, maintain your systems. Don't just walk away from them. I'm glad to see more of these water bags being used in the ooze tubes. It's a good visual reminder that, first, the trees are being taken care of, but second, that you've got to keep putting water in those things. Again, they don't water themselves. These are relatively inexpensive. I think they're $15, 12 to $15, maybe a little bit more. But uh, it's, a, it's a good visual reminder. They hold about 25 gallons of water, and uh, as long as you keep them full. On that note, Again, they don't take care of themselves. You've got to keep putting water in them. This is a planting at a school right down the road. Ginkgo trees, a good, urban, hard-to-kill tree, but they're doing a good job killing these. These bags have been on, and I've checked them every, uh, every Friday for the last three weeks, and they haven't put a drop of water in them, and we haven't had any rain in the last three weeks. So they're slowly killing these trees and, and destroying that investment with something that would be very easy to take care of. And pruning, um, Jim covered this very well, and I'll just briefly mention uh, some goals for, for young tree pruning. You know, you want to maintain the, the health of, of those trees to promote the growth and just removing dead wood, uh, any dying and diseased uh, limbs or branches, and any conflicting limbs that are going to grow the wrong direction or maybe rub against other, other limbs. Um, you know, keeping good structure, keep, keep in mind the, the, the structure of, of a young tree. And you've got about the first two to seven years of that thing being planted in the ground to take care of co-dominant stems, the spacing and attachment of limbs, you know, the overall symmetry. And most important thing is, is maintain the original shape of, of that species of tree. You know, some trees don't need a central leader and, and kind of keep that in mind and keep the, the characteristic shape of, of whatever species of tree you've planted and are, are wanting to take care of. And the most important thing is, is follow through, scouting and integrated pest management. Again, you can't just put these plants in the ground and walk away from them. You've got to, you've got to keep an eye on them. You've got to constantly be in the landscape, regularly looking at things, you know, develop an integrated pest management plan that fish, fits a, a threshold of tolerance for insects and diseases in your, in your landscapes. You need to know the, the good guys from the bad guys. You want to keep the good guys around because they do a lot of good work and keeping harmful insects and diseases that way, um, and be proactive, not reactive. Don't wait until you've got a problem to take care of it. If you get ahead of it sooner than later, you're less likely to, to lose plants and, and stress plants out. And continue to get educated. Um, there's so much you can learn through these webinars, um, online, all, all kinds of, of different directions. And just some pictures of some insects. You know, if I had uh, 20 of, of the, the, the guy up in the left corner on a tree, is that something to worry about? Is this a harmful insect? Is it a beneficial? Knowing the good guys from the bad guys is, is very important. And, and again, you know, looking at your, your landscapes in, in close detail, look under, underneath leaves, on tops of leaves, get ahead of the problem before they, they become a problem. Deer continue to, to be a huge issue in, in most landscapes, urban and home and otherwise. You know, who, uh, if you'd have told me 10 years ago that the, the number of plants that deer will nibble on is, is what it is, I would, have, I would have laughed, but it's amazing what they'll chew on. Um, as the bucks come into season, the picture on the right shows where a tree's been horned up pretty bad. We're to the point now, anytime we put a new tree in, in the arboretum, we've got to put a cage around it to prevent deer from rubbing it or possibly chewing on it. So a huge, huge problem all across the country. 
And real briefly, we want to talk about fertilization. Uh, you need to base fertilizers and any soil amendments and treatments for the soil on soil tests and, and analysis of, of those tests. Don't just blindly put out fertilizer. You may not need it. Easiest way to do that is to take a soil sample. It doesn't take that much time, and most extension services do it for a nominal fee. Uh, it'll tell you exactly what you need based on the species of plant. It's an invaluable, inexpensive tool, and it gives you a base for the life of that tree to take care of in any situation. And finally, um, it's been a pleasure doing these. If you want any further information about the Arboretum, about Bartlett, there's our information there on the screen. And I'll turn it over to Leland for questions. Excellent. Thanks so much, Greg. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Fran, we're going to open the lines again for question and answer. Again, to ask a question, please press star then 1 and record your name. At this time, I have no requests, but you may press star 1 anytime. Great, and I'll also remind folks that you can ask your questions through that Q&A tab as well. I think one of the things you touched on there close to the end of your presentation, Greg, mm -hmm. that I was wondering about, uh, which is sort of pests and uh, invasive pests and selecting both selecting the right trees, trees that are hardy or uh, looking at the uh, sort of variety of trees in your city and trying to determine what to plant for uh, sort of best protection against pests. Right. And then I'll, I'll have a follow-up for Jim, too. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's something that I, that I wanted to mention, and I'm glad you asked the question. Um, when we talked about plant selection, uh, you know, the first, the first step is, is, is finding a good nursery, getting a good, healthy plant. The second step in that same vein is, is picking a tree that's going to do well in whatever site you're going to put it in, picking a tree that can, that can take a certain degree of stress, that doesn't need a lot of aftercare. You know, there's no such thing as a no maintenance, low maintenance plan. I don't care what anybody says. There's a certain degree of, of issues you've got to take care of. So finding um, lists of these types of things. There's lists all over the website. Uh, there's some really good books floating around out there. One that always leaps to mind is Landscape Plants for Eastern North America by Harrison Flint. He's got lists of really good plants in the back of that book. Um, any Google search will turn up all kinds of good urban trees that do well in, in urban landscapes. So starting with that, you'll avoid a lot of disease and insect issues. Um, you know, staying away from plants that traditionally have a lot of issues. Anything in the Rosaceae family always come up with a lot of pest issues. And um, you know, diversity in the landscape. If you do have a pest that attacks something. You know, Charlotte is known for its willow oaks. It's got big ones all through the city. It's a beautiful canopy, but uh, there's a um, there's an insect, a canker worm, that feeds on them in the fall, and its favorite host plant is the willow oak. So it attacks thousands of willow oaks through the city. So diversity is is very important. And if you do have trees that are you know a little bit more sensitive, just keeping a closer eye and knowing when insect and disease issues are going to rise up and occur and getting ahead of those types of problems before they become problems, treating them when they're, when they're early enough. A good example, we've got a, a pretty big crabapple collection, and eastern tent caterpillar can be an issue on them. We know about the time of the year when they're emerging from their egg masses and starting to build their nests. So we'll actually walk through the whole collection, and when we see the nests, when they're very, very small, just remove them by hand. And we've even rigged up pieces of bamboo with the end of a coat hanging around them where we can tear the nests up. And if you get them when they're small enough, they won't rebuild. And that's a really simple, easy way, just walking through, monitoring the landscape, having your hands and eyes um, looking at things and, and making sure that you're, you're getting ahead of any problems that may develop. Great. And so, Jim, uh, in, in terms of working with volunteers and training them uh, in tree care, uh, is checking for pests or thinking about pests something that you guys work on or something you're familiar with uh, other nonprofit tree planting groups engaging in? We don't do a lot of it. Um, we've done uh, a couple of workshops on uh, gypsy moth and emerald ash borer, and I think we're we're poised to uh, react should something become a problem here for us in D.C. Um, like emerald ash borer, for example, we actually don't have a lot of ash trees in our inventory. And so while that is on its way here, um, the concern isn't that great because um, 
the number of ash wouldn't be the number of ash loss would not be that catastrophic in terms of our canopy and our, our mix of species. Um, but I think we have the capacity to train folks um, to to deal with a pest should it become a, a big problem. Um, but we haven't done too much work to date in that area. Okay. Brandon, do we have any questions over the phone? No, none on the phone lines. All right. Uh, one uh, sort of question over the lines, over the, the web. Um, are you working with your volunteers to transition from just planting, watering, and mulching to train them to prune as well uh, so that they can continue to care for those trees for the future? And have you run into any issues with the city, uh, perhaps the city government, uh, allowing or not allowing trained volunteers to prune street trees? That's a great question. Um, we have uh, done a lot of experimenting with training volunteers to pruning and um, also just increasing the technical capacity of our own staff. We've partnered with the National Park Service. Um, they grow a lot of uh, American elms for the downtown mall. We plant a lot of American elms uh, throughout the city on the public right away. And so we work with their grower on training elms and, and structurally pruning elms, which is pretty challenging. Um, and so for trees that we plant in public space, we, um, in small supervised groups of staff and citizen foresters, do a lot of that pruning, about 200 trees a winter. Um, what we found, a couple of challenges in training citizen foresters to prune and to let them prune more broadly across the city. Um, I think we've got the training piece down. We, we brought in uh, Joe Murray from um, from West Virginia to teach a, a couple of classes. We've engaged a number of instructors and, and probably trained up um, probably three dozen, uh, maybe 30 to 50 folks um, in pruning, but not at a comfort level where we would want them, we feel comfortable setting them free to prune without a permit or without some supervision to do structural pruning. Um, I think training to prune dead disease, dying and crossing branches is easy, but to train towards the more challenging sort of six step structural pruning is requires a little more uh, support and technical assistance and, and, and um, attention towards deployment. Um, uh, I think the other challenges are that we are busy planting trees and um, when we take a break to prune trees in the winter, it's often too cold or the inclement, inclement weather discourages folks from coming out and doing that with us. Um, so we're looking at pruning opportunities year round. Um, and then the programmatic end of it, uh, which trees and when um, is is a challenge. Um, we, we don't um, have permission per se to go prune any public space trees. So we need to sort that out with the various uh, owners of whether it's a train a schoolyard or a public library or a street street. Um, that remains to be done. Um, but I think the direction we're heading in is, yeah, first inspecting and monitoring trees and see what, getting a better feel for what kind of pruning needs to have based on what we've planted and the selections we made and, and what problems we're seeing and then developing a program and plan of attack around that for trees that are kind of getting into their five, six, seven years out now. Um, and, and, and we plant trees across public and private space, so there's a lot of coordination involved there to work with volunteers to, to go prune trees. It's not uh, that easy to do. Um, but our most successful experience is that it has been on pruning American elms on the public streetscape the right of way um, with some good success. I don't know if I answer that question in its entirety, but uh, we've been dabbling in it, and uh, there are definitely some hurdles there. Great. Uh, unless we have other questions on the line, Fran? No, none at this time. Then I think we're going to wrap it up now. I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in today's webcast. The presentations from today and the recorded session, as well as a resource list of related materials, will be available in about one week. Uh, and we will email everyone who completes our brief survey 
which you should be able to see right here. Uh, we'll email those resources to you. I want to thank everyone for attending today, and I hope that you will also uh, join us again at our next webcast session, which will be Reaching Bilingual Audiences on September 16th. That's in two weeks. Again, the survey is right up there on the screen. We'll also email you about it, but take a few minutes to uh, complete that for us. It helps us to ensure that we are programming sessions that are interesting to you and, and covering topics that you want to hear about. A huge thanks again to our presenters, to Jim and to Greg. And Greg, thanks again for these, these four excellent sessions. They've been really wonderful presentations, and we really very much appreciate it. And as well, thanks to everyone who took some time out this afternoon to listen, and to our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks very much. Again, thank you, everyone, for your participation today. As you heard, the discussion has concluded. And so all nicely, please disconnect.